Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webinar, The Rambam's Remarkable Correspondence with the Scholars of Lunel with Rabbi Charles Scheer. Please note that this program is being recorded. Also, everyone is muted, but we welcome questions and comments in the chat, and we'll do our best to address them at the end of the presentation. My name is Scott Kalmakoff. I am the coordinator for the Union for Traditional Judaism. Before we begin, a few remarks and notes. Thank you to our sponsors for this webinar series. Rabbi Noah Gradovsky, in appreciation for Rabbi Shear's leadership of the Jewish community at Columbia University when Noah was in college. Chaplain Leslie Kersner, in memory of Jan Blumenthal Eng. Juan Mesa Freidel. Mitch Morrison, in honor of Rabbi Shear for years of enthusiastically sharing the behind the scenes of so much in our tradition. Harry Seeline, in memory of Estelle Seeline, and Howard Wettstein. I'd also like to thank everyone who made a donation along with registering for this program. For those of you who are new to UTJ, let me add a few words of introduction to our organization. The Union for Traditional Judaism, the UTJ, is a group of rabbis, scholars, and lay people who advocate for a passionate, open-minded approach to Torah study and observance of Jewish law, halakha, rooted in classical religious sources and informed by modern scholarship. Our philosophy is distinguished by the symbiotic relationship between faith in the God-given Torah and intellectual integrity, and our emphasis on the sacred framework of halakha as our unifying guide. Finally, let me introduce our speaker. Rabbi Charles Shear served as a Jewish chaplain at Columbia University and Barnard College for 34 years. He then served for 10 years as an educator at a medical center, taught medical ethics, and served as a chaplain. In 2019, he published an annotated translation of the Rambam's letter to the Lunel scholars. His publications include Torah Umada and the Brain Death Debate, In Halakhic Realities, Collected Essays on Brain Death, and Beaker Holim, The Origin of Jewish Pastoral Care. He holds an MA in Talmudic Literature from Bernard Rebel Graduate School of Jewish Studies, studying under Meir Simcha Feldblum, and ordination from Reitz, the Rabbi Isaac Elchanan Theological Seminary. He studied for many years with UTJ founder Rabbi David Weiss Halivni. Now retired, he lives in Riverdale with his wife, Judy Adler Shear. Rabbi Shear, we're turning it over to you. Feel free to share your screen. Okay, thank you. All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. I am also very touched by many of the contributions and kind words that were that were made about me uh, in the context of that your contributions. We very much appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to share with you tonight something that really was a, a labor of love. Uh, probably more decades ago than I'm willing to admit, a bookseller said to me, Rabbi Shur, I have something that I know you'll be interested in. And he encouraged me to buy a particular volume. It was a collection of Chuvot. It was a photocopy of a manuscript that was uh, written in 1765 in Amsterdam. And it was called Pe'er Hador. It contained 150 Chuvot of, of the Rambam. And the salesman was very accurate in noting that it was something that I was greatly interested in. That is in theory. In practice, it sat in my library for decades. Finally, about five or six years ago, I said, it's time for me to encounter the Rambam, not only as a philosopher in his Mora, or as the grand halachic master, either in his Perish and the Mishnah, or in his Mishnah Torah, but to see how he functioned in answering questions that were sent to him. I started a Seder in the, this particular book, and I worked through the true vote. I found that compared to his other works, it was a little bit on the thin side. The Rambam clearly invested his time in his more substantial compositions. When, when an inquiry came to him, he wrote generally a rather brief answer. He might give a source or two, but rarely was it an extended exchange as one finds in Shelo to Chuvot. Then I came upon one particular letter, and as I began to read it, I recognized at the outset, he's beginning with a verse in Yeshayo, the, the prophet Isaiah. And I recognize, the, I recognize the letter. Let me just pull it up for you. Just one second. And this is the letter that he wrote to a particular Abiona Tanha Kohen Melunel. 
I was very excited. Don't read it yet. Wait till we go through it together. We're going to do part of it jointly. I was very excited when I encountered this in Pe'er Hador, because I remember going back to my yeshiva days. I remember Rav Soloveitchik talking about the exchange with the Chachmei Lunel. This was a favorite series of exchanges between the Rambam and scholars in southern France. The history was well known. This was what we, we would call a Chabura. It was a learning fellowship. And the head of the group was Yonatan ben David HaKohen. We know of, of Rabbi Yonatan. He's reasonably well known. When the Rambam wrote his Mishneh Torah, around 1177 and 1178, it began to be sent out to countries throughout the world. When it reached the southern part of France in Provence in the city of Lunel, this particular group undertook a study of the Mishnah Torah in Toto. They found a number of instances when they disagreed with the conclusion that the Rambam presented in his Mishnah Torah. And they decided to send him a, a series of letters which contained these 24 Shailot that they had. In reality, there really were 27 questions because a couple of the questions had multiple parts to it. So it's quite astounding. I mean, here you do a book review in the Mishnah Torah and, and all of its 14 volumes, you find 27 questions to ask where you disagreed with his decision. They sent the letters out to the Rambam and they were expecting that they would receive an answer. Although they would not have said it themselves, one sees how the Rambam, from his words in his letter to them, how highly he regarded their exchange. He recognized immediately that these were Tamidei Chachamim of the highest degree. Unlike other of, of his readers, who, including the Ravad, Avam Ibn Daud, who criticized him for not giving the sources, that was not an issue for this particular group. They had the Bavli Yerushalmi on their fingertips. They knew the Geonic literature. And therefore, they never questioned what his sources really were for his decision, but they disagreed in principle on the point of the law. When I went through the 24 questions, I noticed when I went back to the Mishnah Torah to trace the, 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 the topic, that of the 24, 14 of them were the very same criticisms presented by the Ra'avad, Avraham ibn Dawud, which is not a surprise. He was sort of a a, a Rav, Rav Yonatan of Lunel was like a Talmud Haver of the Ravad. So they thought very, very similarly, and those were the similar kind of questions that the Ravad asked as well in his objections. However, the Rambam did not respond to these men. When the questions were first sent out by Rav Yonatan, he accompanied it by an Egeret. That was an epistle, a very, a very distinctive form of composition. We have the copy of it. It was found in the Cairo Geniza. I ordered it from the Bodleian Library, and it's what graces the cover of my book. It is the letter that Rav Yonatan, the second letter that Rav Yonatan wrote. I'll tell you about the history of the correspondence before I get to it. So Rav Yonatan writes in Egeret, an epistle, lauding the Rambam, etc., etc., giving a little bit of background, and then he presents the questions for the Rambam's treatment. The assumption is, is that they maybe wrote this around 1193 or 94. No answer was presented. So the other members of the Chabura write a letter to the Rambam. And we have those, that letter as well too. The Ada, the community, the Ada of the community writes to the Rambam, no answer. The community then, probably a few more years later, write him once more. Still no answer. Finally, Rav Yonatan takes up the pen, and he first hires a poet to, to develop an appropriate poem, which he adds at the beginning of the letter with apologies that he does not have the ability to write such a literary flourishing motif. And then he reviews the question, he gives the background of the community, and in small letters, Right, perpendicular, writing up and top at the top, he writes in his hand, please respond to me, Rabbeinu, while I still am alive. 
And this letter was found in the Cairo Geniza. The Rambam finally responds to the men, and the scholars who've studied this correspondence estimate that it probably was about 1199. The Ravad already had died the year before. And the Rambam answers them. And when I came upon the section in the Er Hador that I was studying, I came upon the section of Chochme Lunel, I was rather shocked to find that here you have a response by the Rambam. He begins with a pasuk, which I recognize, mi zeba me adom. This is the text you have before you. Hamutz begodi mi etc. This is a verse in Yeshayahu. And I understood what, why the Rambam selected it to open up his Egeret to these men. Because this letter that he received from the, the men was unanticipated. It came to him suddenly, surprisingly. And it came from Edom, that is, Christian Spain. The Rambam now in Egypt already, but saw himself very much part of the, of the Sephardic world. And he sees coming from Edom, Edom, of course, being from Edom, we get to Italy, from Italy, we get to Christian Spain. So when the, when the Middle Ages, Middle Ages scholars wrote to each other, they addressed always the Christian community as Edom. So what is this coming suddenly from Edom, this particular letter? I did not anticipate it. And then in the middle, he says, he sees that uh, it's written by Harav on Ne'arav, line six, Kamayim Karim Biyom. He's like water, refreshing waters on a blistering hot day, so forth and so on. The great honored Rabbi Yonatan HaKohen, Sigulat HaChachamim, the treasure of all the scholars, so forth and so on. So he indicates some awareness. Whereas in reality, he probably did not even know him. When I came upon this letter, the first line I got, because it's a verse from Yeshayahu, but the rest of it is in a very, very distinctive style. I'm just going to say just a few words about it, because the style is really what caught me at the outset. The Rambam composes his entire letter, which is two sides of this page, and virtually the first half is written in what's called a rhymed prose style. It is a very, very specific genre of literature, which was very, very popular in the late Middle Ages, particularly in the Sephardic communities, but it expanded to others as well too. And in the letter, the communication between the Rambam to Chochme Lunel is built upon passages that are found in Tanakh. But what he would do is he would start a verse but then he would change it in order to suit his purpose. And the language of his expression well, the language is, was the language of Tanakh. Very, very different. So he says in, in the third paragraph, when your letters, when your letter arrived that was rich, laden with beautiful, precious st stones and sapphires, gleaming like this, the, the, you can see the, the flowering, flourishing language, et cetera, et cetera. So Talmidim Nisa'uhu Bechekamu Vizro'am. Like a Sefer Torah, the pupils took it and walked around holding it in their arms. And we're going to hear, I'm not going to give you the sources of every single line. When I first encountered this letter, I had studied with a concordancia to see which particular phrase was based upon which particular verse and how did the Rambam change it. That was very important to me when I encountered this letter because I was totally unprepared for such an expression. When rabbis correspond with one another, they would cite verses from Tanakh, but normally as a proof text to demonstrate the coherence of what they want to argue. In this particular case, this was purely a poetic expression. The very first thing that came to my mind when I worked through some of the paragraphs and realized that the Rambam is writing in this militza, this rhymed prose style, was this contradicts the values that the Rambam had postulated in a number of his writings in which he expressed the most negative opinion towards Shira. That's the first thing that, that I thought of when I read this. 
in his commentary in Chelek, in the end, in the end of Sanhedrin, where it tells you if you read certain books, you lose your, your, your share in the world to come. So some of the books are not specified. And all the Mephorshim, all the commentaries and the mission try to figure out, well, we should really know what these banned books are, right? Because if I read them, I'll lose my share in the world to come. So the Rambam says, what are the books that you should not read? If you really are a Talmud Chacham, you're someone who is a Ben Torah, et cetera, et cetera. The Shira poetry. There are at least two votes, there are a few two votes, two or three that the Rambam was asked about, the PU team that many people included in the service. And he said, these weren't even written by people like Chazal, our Chachamim, who were inspired. These were Mishorarim, poets. And he's against including liturgical poems to be added into our Tfilot on the Chagim. In Marvin de Bukhim, he also has negative comments about Shira. And here the Rambam was writing a letter in, in a rhymed prose fashion. So I had to work on that. I dealt with it in the book. Uh, and the things that he does is, first of all, he's using the language of the Tanakh, and he did it with great competence. I was absolutely astonished. I had no idea that this was part of the great Rambam's arsenal and, and his literary skills. And another thing that was actually quite a surprise to me, here now in verse 22, right? So he says, the kasher, I'm, I'm, it's now 21 to 23, kasher nishma gilu sitre matzpunav, based upon verses in Tanakh, when its inner meanings were revealed, and we began to investigate the hidden themes that are there, vayar Moshe. Vayanos mi panav. Now, of course, right, we just read this in Shul very recently. When Moshe saw it, he became frightened and he ran away. Why? Continuing in 24. Because together with this composition, written composition, there was a letter. So forth and so on. This was uh, there was a letter that was there, but then when he began to read it and look into it, I began to see as when I got into this, the, the correspondence that I received, after I got through the flowery letter, he's going to say that explicitly, there were these questions which were like barbs, and they were the criticisms of the Rambam. Hayot im ruach acheret. Ruach uh, Bina, this other spirit that was evidence in what was written, there was a spirit of wisdom and understanding, Ruach Eitzag Vura, but there was the Egeret, which together with it was the Sheilot, Vakushyot, Asher Lo Nishma'u. In other words, he first has a letter that began to compliment him, the great Rambam, and all the things that he has done. But then together with it, there were these questions which seemed to have a very, very different spirit. Vayome Moshe, so Moshe said to himself, Asurana ve'ere et hamare hagadol hazeh. And this, of course, is taken right out of the Chumash. When he sees the burning bush, he says, I better go over there and take a look at this site to see what's going on. So the Rambam opens up with surprise at the questions that are presented to him by these men from Lunel. And at the end, he says, when he read it, he says, at the end, he says, I realized that my children have defeated me, which of course is the famous Gemara passage with Yeshua and, and Rabbi Gamliel. And there's a big debate amongst them and they take a vote and they follow majority rules. And even though they do produce miracles, lo pashamayimi, and in the end of the Gemara, they want to know, well, wh how, you know, what did, wh what, 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 how do we understand this? How did Eliyahu understand this when he encountered this particular debate? So he says, Nitzchuni banai, my children have defeated me, my children have defeated me. So the Rama is invoking all these things, and he ends up being very complimentary, but he acknowledges the fact that the questions that they asked was something that he never anticipated. Then we continue on. I 
I understood very well that my letters, that, 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 that my words, that is my Mishnah Torah, had reached someone who knew to interpret it and to understand it. Right? They would understand the hidden, hidden meanings of it. But they knew how to, to, to debate them back and forth appropriately. And I said to myself, this is going to be a Meshiv Nefesh. They're going to give me sustenance. They're going to sustain me, et cetera, et cetera. And then he says to them, I, I, I already, all, everything that you ask, all your questions were good questions. And all the, the difficulties, I responded to you, et cetera, et cetera. So I said to myself, so what is he writing this letter about? Why does he have this whole poetic enterprise inconsistent with his values? And what is the point of this particular Egeret that he is writing? Let him go to the heart of the matter, respond to the questions, and entertain a discussion with these scholars the way you do in any series of true vote. So what's the theme? What's the purpose of this letter? Why did the Rambam write the letter? So first of all, he says, he says, right? And the reason why my responses delayed a few years, well, they were probably at least six or seven years, but in his calculus, it's a few years, right? He says, there are many reasons. First of all, there's all sorts of the, the, the worries that he's dealing with could have been some of the political instability of the time. Uh, that it also could have been his sickness, which he talks about. His brother died in 1177. His brother was a dealer in precious stones, and he sustained the Rambam throughout his years. We don't know the exact years of birth as a contradiction, either 1135 or 1137. But until 77, his brother David provided for the Rambam. And most likely, he went into the field of medicine, not simply because he was Jewish, but because he needed now to sustain himself. When his brother never died, his ship in the Indian Ocean sank, then the Rambam had to sustain himself. And he writes that he went into a deep depression for many, many years. And that may have been a cause which lingered for, for quite a while. That's the first thing he says. Now, scholars of the Rambam's writings indicate that at this particular time, there was a kind of a topos, there was a style where many times you feigned illness or you exaggerated, even if it wasn't a legitimate cause. So we're not quite so sure because his brother passed away decades before this. But he refers to his holy, when we wrote for I was about ill for a whole year uh, with his sickness. I'm now healed, but I'm simply no longer in a dire strait. It's no longer a serious illness. Most of the day I'm sitting in my bed. Now, we know from another letter that he wrote at this time, which I'll reference in a moment, that it wasn't quite the case. So he seems to be exaggerating it somewhat extendedly. And he's carrying the yoke of all the Gentile community. He was now the premier physician to the vizier of Egypt. And he had a very, very full medical practice. And he had the yoke of this responsibility, which occupied the last decade of his life. Let me amplify that. The, the a biography came out by Davidson from UCLA, Maimonides, The Man and His Work, which I really would recommend. It's a phenomenal piece of work. And in it, he reviews the whole history of the Rambam, his education. He goes through all of his writings uh, of all different types. And Davidson points out that in the last decade of his life, passing away again in 1205, the Rambam's contributions exclusively were in the area of medicine. Indeed, this exchange with the Chachmei Lunel remains to be the, the most extended Jewish work that he compiled during that decade. At this particular time, 
during the 1190s, the Marba Nevochim was given at the Rambam's suggestion by the Chachmei Lunel to Ibn Tibbin to translate. When Rabbi Yonatan Leitz writes his first letter with all the questions, he also says, you know, we'd like to be able to, we, we, we've heard about this magnificent work that you've composed, but we can't read it because we're French, we don't understand Arabic. Would you please send us a translation? So when the Rambam finally writes them back, he tells them, well, you should find a translator. And he recommends Ibn Tibbin, who is living in Provence. And he, of course, does a translation. And then he sends a letter to the Rambam. And he, said, and he says to him, I'd like to come. And you realize, of course, it's from one end of the Mediterranean to another, to come spend time with you, to review my translation, to ascertain that you approve of how I have understood your words. So the Rambam writes him back, and I'm assuming that many of you are, fa are, are familiar with the letter, and because it's a magnificently famous one, probably was written in 1199. And he writes back to Ibn Tibbin, he says them basically, Ainli's man, I have no time. And he describes his daily agenda, his schedule, how he spends a half a day going to the court and he has to deal with all the Egyptian officers and the harem and the officers and the, the, the Sultan's family, et cetera, et cetera. By the time he gets back, he comes home, his courtyard is filled with people, rich and poor, Jewish, Gentile. And he goes to them and he says to them, please let me have a chance to have a little bit of food. I haven't eaten all day. He goes in, he wa washes, has a bit of bread. He comes back and he, and he deals with them. So he says to Ibn Tibbin, basically, I, I really have no time to receive you. He writes a number of suggestions, but he cannot entertain an audience with him. And he references there the responsibility that he has, which is what he cites here as well too, right? So he says, should we put holy, they have basically exhausted my strength. Day and night, I'm busy with my medical practice. He also had to write treatises on various fields of medicine. And Davidson goes through all of them and tells us which we think are, were accurately done by the Rambam, which were not done, which were forgeries not done by the Rambam, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so he says, What can I do after my reputation has gone out to all the various lands they know about me? Now, this particular line, when I read this, when I first saw it, uh, I was a little bit surprised. It seemed a little bit self-aggrandizing, if you will. There's another passage that also is self-aggrandizing, where the Rambam says, uh, you will see it in a few moments, that I was born to become a teacher in Torah. And even in the interuterine state, when I was in my mother's womb, God had fingered me basically to be an Orlegoyim, which of course you recognize is the opening passages in Yemiyahu. And other one, but he says, but I can't fulfill that particular responsibility because Yatsa TV Beolam, my reputation has gone out throughout the entire world. And I said to myself, wait a minute now, what's going on here? The Rambam says that I was chosen by God in the interuterine state to be a teacher of Torah. And that was what I, I was pre-designated to do, but I, I, I couldn't really do it because uh, my, my reputation as a physician overcame that particular role. And when I read the Rambam citation, uh, that he was predestined to become a teacher of Torah, I was shocked really to see Rambam say that about himself. And then what I did is I went back and I read the letter that was written to him by Rabbeinu Yonatan. And when I read the letter of Rabbeinu Yonatan, he was the one who said to the Rambam, your reputation, your teva, has gone out all over the world as being a Talmud Chacham. And we see that in your Mishneh Torah, and we see that in your Merah Nebuchim, 
So Yilamdenu Rabbeinu, please teach us, this is what your teva is, this is your reputation. And you were pre-designated to play this role. And he quotes the verses in, in Yirmiyahu, that you were predestined. Once you were born, you came out, you automatically, you wrote by age 30, this major commentary on the entire Mishnah. I mean, I'm saying that, he doesn't say that, but he says this about the Rambam. And so what the Rambam did is he took the words that Rabbeinu Yonatan said about him, and he turned them around in his letter here back to Rabbeinu Yonatan. And he says, yes, my reputation has gone out. A reputation as a medic, as a physician, as a scholar of medicine. And yes, we'll see it in a moment. I was supposed to be predestined to teach Torah, but now my destiny is to become a teacher of Mada, not of Torah. Let's see the next few lines. Hi, the, I'm on line 52. I didn't have Shahat, Lomini, Lomi Laila. A reputation has gone out. He's not self-aggrandizing. This is the very line that is used by Rabbi Yonatan to the Rambam in his initial letter, which the Rambam now turns around and sends it back to him, but in a different fashion. I'm not... Today, like I was when my younger years. Some of us sadly can identify with these lines a little bit too strongly. My tongue is slow and my hands are very uh, trembling, etc., etc. I, I don't have the physical stamina to engage in writing up this correspondence. You'll see what he means in a moment. And I, and I am lazy, I tarry from even writing a small brief composition. Oh yeah, okay. Therefore, he says, since I'm now become incapacitated because of my mature years, you should not hold it against me that I charge somebody else to write, and look at his terminology, the chuvot, right? The responsa, omiktsar hakitavim, and some of the compositions. He's talking about this letter. He's not writing it in his own hand. This is his own language, but he doesn't have the ability and the time to sit down and write it out. You'll see what I mean in a moment. I didn't write, in other words, when I studied this particular genre of literature, and I spent about a half a year just studying about Militsa, what were the ethics of it? Because I want to justify, did the Rambam write other letters such as this? And the answer is yes. I found other ones, but their structure and their terminology is very, very similar to this one. It is as if he had his other letters in one hand and the letter from Moreno Yonatan in the other, and on the basis of those two, he put together this particular agad which we're reading, which he sent to Moreno Yonatan. And that is how he overcame his, his lack of time he basically had a style of a letter. Many of us are familiar with that, right? Whether it's giving a Dvar Torah or rehearsing a shir or giving the same sermon or whatever it might be, he had a particular format that he followed. So he says, don't think it's because I had any lack of respect for you, but I simply didn't have the mental and physical and emotional capacity to go through the composition that it would entail. So I had somebody write on my behalf. And I charge them, right? I don't have any time for this because of my lack of spirit and all the various distressing factors that have come to me during this time. Now, I try to figure out what each one of those clauses means in his justification for his tardiness. And in the book, I, I, can, I can define some of them. However, I was left with a question because essentially he should have stopped it here. 
And instead, he continues with what, which the issue that really is the heart of the letter to my thinking and why I'm sharing it with you today. Because he goes on and he gives another justification for his tardiness. And I can tell you, my friends, when I first read this, I was blown over by it. And I read it over a few times and make sure I think I understand it correctly. Because I, it was totally unanticipated. So let's just go. I'm not, I'm not even going to let you see the lines. We'll go through it line by line. So here he has all these justifications, emotional, physical health, political issues, time factors, exactly the same kind of thing that he wrote to Ibn Tibbin. As a matter of fact, he could have written the same letter to Ibn Tibbin to these men. I don't have time to respond to you, not because I don't respect you. But that's not what he says. But I want to tell you, confess to you, the glorious Rav Yonatan HaKunel, and all the learned men around him reading this letter. Now here it is, this is the Navi. Even though, before I was fashioned in the womb, the Torah actually designated me, had chosen me. Before I emerged out of the room, out of the womb, I was designated to be able to teach it. To disperse, right? All of these streams all about. Oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is my, my maiden wife. This is my first love. That is the Torah. In my love with her, I have been involved my entire life. Torah has been my entire world. But nonetheless, Despite my love for Torah and my involvement in it for all these decades, Nashim Nachriot Nasu Latzarot. There were some strange women who became co-wives together with her. Moabiot, Ammoniot, Adomiot, Sidoniot, Thitiot, etc., etc. There were women of all these different ethnic backgrounds became co-wives together with the Torah. Let's keep going. God knows, sorry, pull it down a little bit. They were only supposed to be assistant cooks, a sous chef, a sous chef, to help in the kitchen. To show off the beauty of the Torah to all the other people, right? He tovat marehi, that she is very, very beautiful. And he adds in the word that comes across in the Megillah, talking about Esther, ad me'od. Mikol makom, I'll explain in the, in the moment if it's not clear. Nit ma'ata o nata. After a whole time, the co-wives, who were supposed to coexist together with the Torah, caused me to diminish the ona, the time I had to be engaged in sexual a, a congress with my beloved wife. Because in, in this coming Shabbat of Parsha, in, it says, if you, you should not d- diminish difficult words, but the word ona is understood to mean that if you're married to a woman, you're supposed to fulfill her sexually. You're not allowed to diminish an appropriate amount of sexual engagement with your partner, with your wife. So he says, what happened now, I got involved with these foreign women, but, and they were supposed to be just a sous chef in the kitchen to help out my real wife. That is, to be able to teach Torah and show it in terms of critical scholarship and to show exactly its beauty, how beautiful the Torah is, by using these other handmaidens to show off the glory of Torah. But I found out after a while that these co-wives became competition. And the time for Ona with the love of my life was mi'at, became diminished. Now here is the phrase. My heart became divided in different sections because of all different fields 
of knowledge. Wow. What the Rambam is saying to these men, in other words, what bothered me was, he should have stopped before the paragraph that begins, Umodeyani. He should, Umodeyani Moshe, the Hadrat Harav Yehonatan. He should have said, he gave four or five different reasons why my, this correspondence got stuck in, the, in Egypt. Because of the emotional issues, the physical issues, the et cetera, et cetera, and because I'm very busy with my medical practice. The same kind of a thing that he said to Ibn Timbin, who wanted to come to consult with him about his translation. But to these men, the men who knew his, his heart because they heard about his Mara Nebuchim. They had written him already beforehand. The letter about astrology came from this particular group when they were probably in, the, in Marseille. And they wanted to know from the Rambam, is astrology kosher in terms of Jewish thought? And ultimately, he does write them back. And Rabbi Yonatan, in his letters, says, by the way, you may know who we are, but we're the guys who wrote you that question about astrology. And we know that you're a, cho, you're a chacham. Therefore, we're writing you because your teva, your character has gone out. We understand you as being a person, you'll pardon me if I use YU terminology, who specializes in Torah and Mada. And he writes them back and says to them, you sent me a shyly, asked me a question. I couldn't answer you because I was too busy studying Aristotle. That's what he says here. He had a complete answer before he got to this paragraph, Modia Ani. And his answer was, I'm busy. But to these men, only to these men, Men that he could trust because he knew they valued his engagement in Chochmah as well. He says, I want to admit to you. And there's even a humor here because he knew they would know the verse that's being quoted, which is in the book of Milachim. And it's a verse that he quotes here, which Shlomo, Shlomo basically is talking about the Melech Shlomo, that King Solomon, for political uh, treaty reasons, had wives from all different nationalities. And he married them initially because he had no choice. That's what one did if you were a king in the ancient world. But ultimately, these wives, the many wives that he had, seduced him, and, and the forms of Avodah Zarah were introduced into, into his palace and into his life. So think what's going on here. I mean, the Rambam knew they would know this verse. What he's saying to them is, you get involved with these, these other fields of scholarship, right? And you might want to do it in order to enhance Torah. Because when I understand, fill in the blank, Shakespeare's sonnets, I can then take Shira Shirim and show how they're different and, how they're, and what, the, what, what are the common images, et cetera, et cetera. And how, when I look at, you know, when I, when I read someone like Robert Alter, I can enjoy him because he is a scholar of literature. He knows about the, 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 the methodologies of fiction and poetry. And therefore, he can show certain things in Chumash, which other Mifarshim, even the greats of our tradition, would not aware of. In other words, some of the very things that I'm assuming attract many of you were coming to a UTJ uh, uh, a webinar. And those of you who are members in UTJ, like me, have that very same compartmentalized heart. That if I turn around and show you the books on my desk, there's the Gemara, there's the Chumash, etc. But there are books on other forms of scholarship and literature. And there is Augustine's Confession, which I've just gone through for the third time. And I go through the very same tension that the Rambam is here. So what's different about this is not that you're learning something new about the Rambam. I'm assuming everybody in this call knew that the Rambam wrote the Roman Nebuchim. That he was a person who was interested in scholarly, scholarly thought and philosophy. But here you're seeing, so to speak, ad kedekach. What he's saying here with remarkable honesty, he's bearing his soul to say, you know that there's even a downside to this stuff. Because after a while, the ona, with the love of your soul and your life, there's a competition. And at least, I, and I delayed in responding to you, men who are men of Torah and men of Chochmah, because I was so involved now with Chochmah at this particular juncture, meaning largely medical science. 
but he's talking in a more general sense because he's not simply saying that I'm involved in medicine. That he said above, when he said, ol, ol hagoyim, he meant he has to write when his people or his sponsor said, I want a book on you know, all different medical subjects, et cetera, et cetera. He had to produce those volumes because once his brother died, he was dependent upon the maintenance by others. He was not receiving compensation from the Jewish community. So all Hagoyim and, and Rufua, et cetera, et cetera, he's already evidenced that above. Here he's talking about there was a, if you will, an intellectual or a spiritual distraction that I was involved, not just because I chose to become a physician, but I'm involved in the whole world of Chochmah, by which he meant philosophy, science, et cetera, all the various areas of other things that for many people we are forbidden to study. So I think that uh, I'll read you the last few lines. The, this is what, to my mind, is so uh, uh, compelling about this letter and why I decided to, to translate it, because he is now revealing his innermost heart when he could have gotten away with a different, with a very, very different letter. And he says, Makol, makom, the, the, my time for sexual congress with my wife has become less because my heart is broken up in all different compartments. I have many, many, many loves that are seducing me. And he says, How many years, a, a succession of 10 years I spent on this particular compila compilation, gathering together all the various different sources. And great men like you, you will understand what I accomplished basically here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and then he concludes his letter. So I think that's what I'm, that's what I find so inspiring is that particular admission, one which was unnecessary, which one which he was reveals only to these particular men here. And I hope that for some of you, you'll take a look. I'm not saying this simply to plug my book. Uh, I make no money of it, I can assure you. Uh, um, but, to, but to read this letter that he writes here and you go through it and you see the Rambam in a very, very different guise. He is now, uh, he is not hiding his innermost feelings here. Uh, he may be using certain phrases that are stock phrases, which are expected in an epistle in the Gareth such as this. But these particular lines, I think, are the real, are the real Rambam. And he's showing us in real time how he understood the cost and his neshama, so to speak, because of his involvements in the other areas of Chochmah. That's what I get from the letter. And I think that's what he's calling out to us by this particular writing. Okay, that's really what I wanted to say frontally, and I'll leave the rest of the time for you for questions or debate. I have a question. I'm curious about you know, that, that admission, which is so profound. And I'm wondering if, if, if you embrace or pursue something that's outside of your immediate world, can often suggest that there's something that's maybe lacking or unsatisfying in that world that you've been in. And I'm wondering if that's something that has been elaborated a little bit. And so was there something that he just found was missing in traditional Torah scholarship at that time that he was able to find with Aristotle? That's a very good question, Mitch. Thank you for asking it. Uh, but I'm gonna take you literally at your words because it's going back to his writing. And he already says quite a lot of personal stuff that he does not say. What he does say is he went involved, he got involved in these other areas in order to elucidate the Torah with greater clarity and showing off its beauty. And the, the example that I gave you seems to be the only thing that he refers to, because he says, to show off her beauty. She was taken... I studied these other areas to be able to let people appreciate the, the, the beauty of our tradition. It's not because there's a chisaron in it. Now, we may feel that way, right? But the Rambam is not, I, I, I did not hear that in his, in his admonition. So I'm taking you literally from your word. Uh, if you felt that way, he's not saying it. 
Any other questions, comments? So I uh, put this in chat. If Rabbi Shir could, yeah. could uh, discuss a bit about uh, some of the issues with uh, questions of authentic authenticity of writings that are credited to Rambam, including R Rav Kapach's uh, thoughts on that. And for instance, one could imagine, you, you mentioned the seeming disparity between Rambam's dislike of poetry and the, the poetry in this, you know, one potential explanation could be maybe maybe this is some other writer. So if, if you could just comment on, on some of those issues. Okay. Good, thank you. So, so now, now what I was referring to is in 1985, uh, a memorial volume was published uh, in, in memory of Rav Yitzchak Nisim, uh, Sfardi Rav Rashi. And one of the articles was written by Rav Kapach, who of course is an expert on the Rambam, one of the world's great scholars in Rambam, Allah Vashalom, who passed away. Uh, and, and, uh, and he wrote a whole article saying that he thought that the, the response of the two vote, the 20 to the 24 that the Rambam wrote were a forgery. And, he, and uh, I'm, I went through it. Uh, and right after in that volume, Rav Yitzhak Shailat, who is the person that has really been my teacher in these matters, of Shailat is, is, is one of the world's experts on the writings of the Rambam. He's put out his Igrot, he's put out his Haktamot, he has his, his, his uh, Avot, uh, and, he has all the, and he also knows all the scholarly apparatus. So right as a Rav Shailat's volume, uh, and that's the one that I photocopied, because he has some of the citations of the verses, not all of them, but uh, uh, Rav Shailat wrote an article which they printed right after Rav Kapach's declaration of this being a forgery. And what he said, what Rav, Rav Yitzchak Shailat says is exactly what I felt when I read it. If you go through, as did I, all of these 24 questions that were asked of the Rambam, and you go back, remember these are questions about things that he wrote in the, more in the, in, in the Mishnah Torah. So you go back and you look around the Mephoshim that are around the page. The earliest one is the Migdal O's, 13th, 14th century. Uh, and you have the Magid Mishnah, the Lecha Mishnah, the, the Kesef Mishnah of Yosef Karo, later on, etc. Every single one of them is studying the very same letters that we have, commenting about it, di digesting them, critiquing them. You have a whole world of literature about these 24 Chuvot that the Rambam wrote. And all of the major commentators on the Rambam until Rav Kapach did not question their authenticity. And it's rather amazing. So Rav Shalad wrote that up and he said, look at this one, look at that one. We have the Rambam and we have the Rambam's son. I mean, I, I have it even on, on the page here, telling how much his father enjoyed the letters. So it seems that the Rambam enjoyed him during his lifetime. He made him well known. His son, Avraham ben Harambam, writes about it. And all the Mephoshim and the Rambam know about it. And they're the same letters that we have. Number one. So, so when Rav Shailat put that out, I thought he basically ended the discussion. So Rav Kapach, Rav Kapach wrote a one-page, quickly little memo saying, no, no, no. He basically wrote letters that he never got because they were the ones that were forged, uh, and and some or other they never really they never really survived. The, and I'm sorry, the original letters that were written by the Chachmei Lunel and his responses to it, those were those disappeared, and the ones that we have now are ones that were written later on, which gives you about 150 years for people to write a, a forged letter. All we know is that we have these letters discussed and debated by all the major commentators on the Rambam. And the proof is that the Igeret, which Rav Kapach is not talking about, he's only talking about the Rambam's halakhic responsa. He doesn't talk about the letter, but the letter accompanied the 24. And we have the letter, right? It was found in the Cairo Geniza. And in the letter, it says things that only the Rambam would have known. Why? Because the letter that was from Rabbi Yonatan is the very one that the Rambam then turns around and directs back to Rabbi Yonatan. So he obviously got it. And secondly, there were other letters that the Rambam wrote. In Rav Shalat's publication, 
he has the letter to Anatoly Hadayan, Hadayan that he appointed. He was serving in, it happens to be serving in, in, in Egypt, came from Provence, and he writes him also an Igeret. And the Igeret is the same style. So we see that the Rambam wrote these letters. It was expected of people who were in the Sephardi world to know how to write these letters. That the sign of an educated person meant that you knew how to write this composition. And matter of fact, Rabbi Yonatan is not so sure about his little poem, so he hires and pays for a poet to write a little letter at the beginning. So the Rambam, we have other examples where he wrote letters, and the letters are similar to this very same one that he writes back to Rabbi Yonatan. So if so, Kapak is basically saying that the letters were lost. And then these things were very quickly found. And these are the ones that we are now assuming the Rambam saw and he rejoiced. It's highly, highly unlikely that no one until Rav Kapach found out that these letters were a forgery. And I'll give you the final proof. I have trouble with one of the answers that the Rambam gave. And it's one that is right up our alley, alley of today's presentation. The Chachme Lunel asked him a question. In the Mishnah in Hulin, it tells you what are the various different types of deformities which render an animal to be treif. And the principle, there is a principle even. It has to be some kind of a malady that ultimately would bring about the demise, the death of the animal. All those things are the treifot. The Rambam in Mishnah Torah gives an introduction. He says the treifot are not based upon chokhmah, the, and Mada, they're not based upon science, they're based upon Masoret. And they either they're into their specific maladies, and all of them would bring about the demise of the animal. The Mishnah says that if the lower mandible, the lower jaw of an animal is detached, it does not, it's not considered to be a trefa. Now I know that, having consulted with people who know about animal husbandry to understand the Rambam better, right? you can pop it back in. Many of us who are parents might remember you had a child and you were slapping him by the arm, right? And you dislocated the arm out of the shoulder. You go to the pediatrician, they give it a zetz and they pop it back in. So the dislocated lower mandible does not render the animal treif. That's all it says in the Mishnah. The Rambam, in Mishnah Torah says, but if the upper mandible, the upper jaw is detached, that is considered to be a siman of trefot. So the Chachmei and Lunel catch him. Rambam, we've never seen any sefer, never where it was written that that is something which is treif. Yulamdenu Rabbeinu, how do you know this? So the Rambam writes them back. And he says to them, well, the upper mandible is not trafe. That's what the Mishnah said. The lower mandible is not trafe. That's what the Mishnah says. But he goes to a little bit, a little bit of an essay of animal bovine uh, uh, anatomy and explains to them that if the upper mandible is detached, the animal will ultimately die. And therefore, he included it in one of the trafe. And he says, this fulfills the concept. That's his answer. Now, now. Uh, um, Rav Kapach did not deal with this in his response. But when I came to that, I said, wait a minute now. What he's basically doing, he's using science instead of halakha. There's not a masorah about the upper mandible, only about the lower mandible, that it's kosher. The Rambam knows science, and therefore he adds it in to one of the 70 trefot. And they're right to say, whoever taught this beforehand? The Rosh Bar says, I have to think about it. I'm very impressed by it, right? One of the other Mephoshim says, this he got, Rabbi Yosef Kha, I think it's in the case of Misha, says he got this from his knowledge of, of animal husbandry. He knew about science. And there's a, whole, uh, there's a whole book that's written by Levenger where he talks about the halakhic uh, uh, positions of the Rambam in terms of his, his, his utilization of science. And he quotes this. And Isaac Herzweiss in his, his book says, this is one of the occasions where the Rambam deviated and he followed Chochmah rather than the Masorah. So the Rivash, Yitzchak Vasheshit, right? 15th century from Spain ends up in, in, in Algier. He jumps on the Rambam. Hirschman in his biography of the Rivash 
quoted the Rambam than more than any other Svardi of the late Middle Ages. He loved the Rambam. But the Rivash in one of his Shavuot says, how could the Rambam have said this? He's, he says he, he might be making the butchers happy because some animals would be considered to be consumable, but it's not a tray, it's just not a tray fight. It's not, we have no masur. We don't follow the chokhmah, we follow the masur. So the reverse says, sorry for you, I can't figure it out. And in my book, I go and I have it in the footnote, I go through all of this and I say, it seems to be really a problem. How do we understand the Rambam? Now, what I did not go back and say that here is a responsum that the Rambam wrote to the Chachma Lunel. And since it is problematic, that proves that not that his tshuva is false, what he said in Mishnah Torah also must have been forgery. So Rav Kapach has to go to all of these questions because if the questions are based upon positions that the Rambam adopted and he's defending it in his responsum, but it's what he said in Mishnah Torah, then he's not gonna change his opinion in Mishnah Torah. So do you mean that was a forgery also? So I think Rav Kapach, I mean, I, you know, as I said, he's the first one to say that. And given the fact that I can document that the Igeret for sure was composed by the Rambam, because it's mimicking the Rambam's other letters, which this forger did not have. It's mimicking the letter of Rav Yonatan that was written to him, which again, the forger didn't have. So we see the Rambam is writing this on his own. Now his answers, many of them are difficult but it doesn't mean they're forgeries. It means what used to be called in yeshiva is a shvera rambam. It's a difficult rambam. But I wouldn't jump back to say they're forgeries unless I could document it. Great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments before we close it out? All right, Rabbi Shear. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. Thank you for joining us, everybody. It's really a pleasure to hear from you, Rabbi Shear. And we hope that you'll come back and speak to our uh, organization again. It was a really wonderful presentation. And again, thank you. A tremendous thank you to our sponsors. We're going to send their names in the chat one more time. I also just wanted to mention very quickly that, um, oh, I can't share my screen because I am um, recording this meeting, but Chacham Isaac Sassoon, who was a faculty member of the Institute of Traditional Judaism, um, he's having a book launch. And we're going to be sending out information about that as well in the follow-up email to this presentation. And I think that's something that's uh, worth looking into. Uh, he is a tremendous scholar and Talmud Chacham, and uh, I'm excited to see what his new book, what insights are in his new book. So be on the lookout for that in our upcoming email in the follow-up to this presentation. All right, thank you everybody. Good night, Laila Tov. <laughs>